Welcome to the Legion Strength and Conditioning Podcast. You can check us out at legionsc.com or follow us on Instagram at legion.sc. So when people do conditioning work, they often think of it as doing a Metcon, quote unquote. And as coaches, we don't necessarily just think of things as Metcons, right? That there's a lot more involved in designing conditioning workouts to get an appropriate stimulus especially in mixed modal work, meaning mixing and matching different things. So it's not just about doing Metcons or throwing together some conditioning or anything like that. It's about understanding exactly what we want to happen in a conditioning workout and creating it such that an athlete is going to get that intended stimulus, which could be, you know, doing something that is uh, uh, very muscle endurance focused and kind of grindy. It could be doing something that has a bunch of pieces that force them to slow down. It could be doing something that's very high power output and has them rolling around on the ground after it could be doing something that's pretty high turnover and doesn't have a lot of opportunities for them to stop during the process that all of those are slightly different. And if people are just doing Metcons, they're not necessarily thinking about the different stimulus from those types of workouts and what the impact is on the athlete, both in terms of a training adaptation result, as well as just a day-to-day stress result. So I think it's pretty important to understand that there are different feelings and in, in, in stimuli from conditioning workouts and that we actually have to think about what we're trying to do when we have conditioning pieces. Yeah, we've we've spoken a lot on this podcast about, um, for instance, how you train in, in, in other sports where you're going through drills and you're trying to elicit like a, a very specific response from a drill, um, which then allows you to play the game. Um, and if you look at it, say, for instance, with CrossFit, a lot of people understand the idea of trying to target certain things within a Metcon and they understand the different uh, sort of um, characteristics that you, you're going to get in conditioning. But a lot of the time as well, people will still approach everything uh, fa- fairly the same as well. They're not necessarily trying to get as much as they can from that. Um, so you know, it usually re- involves some going out a little bit too hot, um, finding a point where, you know, you might find that, that you drop off your pace a little bit and then it becomes a little bit more of you playing catch up for the rest of the workout um, or the conditioning piece. But what I I think is really important that uh, people try to understand is that when you are trying to create some form of training stimulus, there is, there's obviously a lot of intent within that. Um, You know, you're going to have some physical, physiological adaptations that occur, which is usually the, the sort of, uh, overall the primary goal however there is also a lot of coping and strategizing and understanding and sort of more of just a an actual uh, thought out learning process through that um, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that people um, grasp that until they 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 go through you know something that's going to be like remote coaching um, where they're actually told like hey you need to work on this or whether they're going to be going through some form of competitive programming and it's literally sort of, you know, put in front of you. You are working on this. This Metcon is doing this. Um, because a lot of the time we come from a class environment where, you know, you're, you're in the gym, you hit a strength piece, uh, which is going to be taking up the majority of your session. And then, you know, you've got 15 minutes left to hit a Metcon and it's, you know, going to be a, a triplet of, you know, a monostructural movement, gymnastics movement and a barbell movement. And you're just going to, you know, roll through that just to sort of create some, a good amount of intensity so that people's training is um, somewhat balanced, you know, because if you think about it, the average person that's coming into a CrossFit gym per week, you know, you're looking at maybe three times per week. So a lot of the time programming in gyms is done so that that person who comes three times per week gets a good amount of balance where if you are going into something that's going to be uh, more directed towards competition, you'd likely to be training for about six days a week. So you can actually start to to really compartmentalize your training, uh, have higher intensity days, have lower intensity days where you might have to be accumulating a little bit more volume of aerobic work, things like that. So I I think it's really important that people understand uh, that when you are training for a sport, you have to approach it as such and you have to think of it as, okay, you know, when you were doing PE and you were playing, you know, whatever sport it was, you were going through drills for that to practice a certain scenario. And that's exactly what we want to do in CrossFit as well. Yeah, I think something you touched on there is really important that we have to understand the distinction between being in a 
prep phase for a competition versus training, right? Versus testing, which are all not exactly the same thing. And there's been plenty of words spoken and written about the difference between training and testing. But I also think it's important to distinguish between training to enter a competition phase versus training to actually get better at something specific, right? So like you mentioned, Luke, specifically within our sport of CrossFit, there's a lot of um, messy stuff that happens, right? That you're going to get thrown into non-ideal workout situations. You're going to get workouts that kind of don't make sense in terms of the programming of them. You're going to get multiple events in the same day that are all heavily based upon knee flexion. You know, all this stuff is going to happen. And so you, you essentially have to be ready for that. And so so when we're training leading into something that is going to be a competitive phase, we have to just do, I mean, sort of like I said in the intro, right? Just a lot of quote unquote Metcons because that's probably what's going to show up in a competition. So you just kind of have to be ready for it and you have to be used to a bunch of different crazy events and you, and, and you just sort of have to be adaptable to whatever is going to show up. But that's not necessarily the best way to actually train to enter a, a competitive phase, right? That some people can, in fact, sort of do anything and everything in a bunch of messy workouts and just adapt and get better at everything all at once and have great results from that. But those are the folks who tend to be elite in the sport already, and they either are just very adaptable or they've built up enough training and understanding of their own pace that they can just sort of do everything essentially, quote unquote, right, uh, just out of, you know, their intuition and, and their experience, whereas other people can essentially blow themselves up trying to do that. They, they end up um, pacing things incorrectly. They can't adapt to the stress. Uh, they do too much volume of certain movements and they just fall apart. So for those people, they need to be much more deliberate about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And then when they are entering that competition phase, like, yeah, you know, all bets are off and you just got to do whatever is going to show up and, and sort of smash yourself and, and see what happens. But leading into that, we want to be much more focused on, okay, for you, you need to improve your ability to do high repetition, upper body pulling under fatigue, right? And, and, and you seem to be okay in a more muscle endurance perspective, but when it's focused more on conditioning fatigue, uh, that you start to kind of lose it. So let's create a bunch of different scenarios for you to actually practice that, which is going to involve potentially a salt bike into unbroken sets of chest to bar pull-ups. Maybe we want to start adding in some mixed pieces and you're going to do a salt bike and burpees to get you nice and tired, and then actually do some, again, unbroken sets of chest to bar pull-ups. And, the, and the, that's the scenario that you need to improve at. So we we want to focus our actual conditioning efforts and training on improving that specific skill and that specific trait rather than just being like, oh, okay, yeah, you struggle with upper body pulling. Here's a bunch of Metcons with pull-ups in it. That, that's just not good enough. And I think, <clears throat> I think a lot of what you're talking about there, it really comes down to um, being able to make all different aspects of training accumulate to the same... Um, outcome so you talk about upper body pulling there well it's like okay we can do some fatigue sets we can do some pieces where you're already breathing heavy or your heart rate's high or we can do it where you come into it pre-fatigued um, in terms of that muscle group um, but then you can look at the strength side of things and say okay well we can work on getting you stronger in an upper body pull we can if we increase your pulling strength it's going to be easier to increase your muscular endurance um, so really it's it's kind of a Although I actually don't agree with that, John. I'm gonna I'm gonna step I'm gonna step on what you just said there. Well, that's okay. Oh. <laughs> well, you you don't have to agree with me, but but what I mean is, um, I think all aspects of a program, whether it's we're looking at just conditioning or whether we're looking at uh, muscular endurance or whether we're looking at strength, I think still tie into the same outcome. Yeah, and I think that sometimes that process can be quite overwhelming for people because there's the, the, there is a lot of um, there's a lot of things that you need to work on just to be able to take part in the sport right you need to still be able to maintain certain uh, movements certain training um, yeah certain styles of training um, certain styles of competing that you, you need to be able to maintain that but at the same time when you are further away from competition, you have to go through these sort of accumulation phases where you are really looking uh, at things a lot more granularly and you have to figure out, okay, well, what are the three th main things that are preventing you from getting to where you want to be? 
and you look at you, you, your leaderboards, you look at your competitions, you look at their, their training history, you look at their competing history, and then you create a plan based off of that and you just make sure that they are able to maintain. Um, you know, what often happens is people go through years and years and years of being able to push everything up at the same rate, but just because they're completely new and because they're just, you know, they, they, they're not actually training something enough to be able to exhaust that progression um, as far as they want to. And then it gets to a certain point whereby they stop making that progress with several things and they essentially, you know, you see a lot of people quit the sport because of that. You see a lot of people um, not enjoy themselves as much in training because of that. And I think that what people have to understand is that when you're at that level, you've you've accumulated enough training volume that you're you're almost a little bit stuck on certain things and numbers aren't moving in the way that you want them to, or you know, you you can hammer as many sets of 30 on 30 off um as you, as you want to at a certain RPM, but trying to push it up a little bit more is really, really difficult and just you end up blowing up. You have to then sort of dial it back a little bit and you have to actually look at things in terms of okay what do I really specifically need to work on um this movement keeps on coming up in a competition and it keeps on derailing me um I can do it in fine in this sort of you know um, non-fatigued state but as soon as it's paired with this movement or as soon as it's in this environment that's where it really starts to um trip me up and then you have to create training that essentially just puts people in those situations and allows them to make the physiological adaptations but also the the learning to be able to cope in those situations better as well and then all with with all of that taken into consideration there are some things that people just aren't necessarily built for and their their sort of adaptation their progress is actually really quite limited and that's something that people actually need to uh, get over as well sometimes as well so and it's quite difficult yeah, I mean, long-armed folk are always going to have a hard time with strict handstand push-ups relative to the field, right? Yeah. And that that's that's just something that you can hammer it repeatedly, but you just might not ever actually be "quote unquote" good at that relative to the folks who you're competing against. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't work on it, but you know that 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 people's expectations for improvement can be uh, uh, potentially not in alignment with that. And we'll, and we'll see that as well in, in certain physiological traits, right? As far as maybe just a ability to create power on an assault bike or a row type of workout or ability to um, do like heavy clean battery that, that certain people are going to have limitations that are very challenging for them. And that that's always a tough thing because you, you don't want to get folks thinking that they can't improve um, because that's not a good spot to be, but you also don't want people thinking that they're just not trying hard enough or whatever, uh, and that they just need to push harder when it's like, actually your body is not built to do this. So you're just going to have to figure out a different way to compete if that's what you want to do, because this is always going to be something that's, that's challenging for you. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I can really relate to that, uh, sort of like heavy battery clean scenario and it's something that I've always I've I always did struggle with and even when I sort of I, I personally went through a bit of a phase where I just focused on weightlifting to be able to get better at it and I was probably like one of the worst things to do because it just sort of built up this expectation and you know I, I actually I, I got stronger but then I wasn't actually able to perform as well in those scenarios and I just I made that align alignment in my head and it didn't work um, but what you want in those situations is when when people are sort of under realization that this is never going to be something great for me. It's about understanding that, owning that, being able to like uh, cope in that situation as best as possible. Sort of you know control the controllable, manage the rest, that type of stuff. And then on the events that they are very good at, or on the areas where they are able to make that improvement, you have to just absolutely hammer that and push that. And I think that you know sometimes it you know if you have, a, have an athlete who's not necessarily very 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 well balanced and you know they they do struggle with certain movements and it does seem that things are slowing down in terms of progress sometimes it's about actually making them really good at the stuff they are good at so that they can actually just build up that um they can build up that lead against the field in those events to make up for you know whether they, they aren't necessarily as strong um i know that doesn't necessarily align with sort of the idea of balanced fitness but when you are getting to that level of competition where it's okay we need to get as much from everything as we can um that's where you have to look at things a little bit more objectively and a little bit more um 
down this sort of like competitive scope um, to maximize their results. And I think people also can't be afraid of getting stuff wrong when it comes to training. Um, like some people are of the mindset that if they work on something, it's automatically going to get better. Um, and they do a certain, you know, a certain um, progression or, or kind of strategy in terms of working on a movement. Not everything's going to work. You know, progress isn't linear and on a weakness, it's even less so. You know, you find something that might work for you, but it might take three different training sort of progressions or techniques before you find something that actually works. And, you know, people can't be afraid of, of having these stalls and setbacks and having training like regimes or programs or pieces that don't positively affect their performance. Well, and it's also really hard to figure out if something does work, what actually did it, right? Was it the most recent training cycle that you did? Probably not, especially if you've been stalled on something, like you said, John, for a long time. And it's like, okay, here's like another cycle focused on, you know, in, in loose case, heavy squat, clean repeatability and you plateau forever. And then at some point you just suddenly get better. I'm like, why did that happen? Who knows? <laughs> we've been working on it for a year. I don't know. Something happened or you might never get better. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. But I think it's, it's rare that training is wasted. You know, even if yeah, you don't see that immediate improvement, it's, it's unlikely that that has done nothing for you. Yeah. Like it did. Yeah. I mean, the, so it's even, even sometimes I've, I've told people that, okay, once you get to it and you know, sometimes I put ranges on the amount of sets that they have to do. And it's like, okay, as soon as you start losing speed or as soon as you start losing like a certain RPM or as soon as you start losing movement quality, cut it cut the set but still people choose to sort of push forward because they there is it's almost this like okay more is better and I, you know I'm, I'm like one uh, you know muscle up progression set away from being able to knock these out unbroken in workouts it's like no it doesn't happen like that <laughs> and it's i just think a lot of the time people curate their experience in the gym so much so that they are doing the things that they are good at and doing the things that they like and you know you see this constantly like on on sort of social media people don't post the stuff that they don't like um and people always are curating this uh, experience in the gym this uh sort of image of them as an athlete and then it, you know they they don't actually like try to challenge themselves in training uh, enough or they don't let themselves get to those point where they're like ah shit i need to figure this out oh you know um and we, you see this on the basic level of people just trying to develop skills in, in classes all the time you know whether it's like double unders you know it, it's sort of yeah you're gonna have to like whip yourself loads of times for about 10 minutes you know a couple of times a week and you're going to have to do that for a few months. And then, you know, you're probably going to get them. And then you have to then start learning to do that when you want to get more than 10 unbroken. And then it, it's just a constant sort of rinse and repeat process. And I think that people have to, you know, understand that, especially when it comes to skills that have a certain capacity element to them as well. Because it ends up, you know, sometimes the skills become so fluid that, that it ends up actually just becoming more of like an endurance based thing. And when we're, when we're thinking about designing conditioning workouts based upon these certain skills or these weaknesses, the, the goal is to, to figure out the optimal level of challenge for that individual relative to where they're at, right? Because if it's too hard for them, not that there's not value in occasionally doing something that's just completely out of your reach just to see what happens, but that that's usually not going to be effective training, that we want to set things up such that the conditioning workout that we're prescribing, Luke, like you mentioned, is potentially just outside of their capacity. We want to see a certain amount of repeatability. We want it to be challenging, but not overly challenging. And we want them to be able to, to consistently show proper execution at a certain degree of difficulty and then try to improve it from there. So, you know, I mean, we, I think we can give some more tangible examples of something like, let's say, um, squat clean repeatability, right? At heavy weights that uh, the, the sort of conventional uh, simplistic thinking on that would just be, okay, well, I just need to do you know, a weight, uh, yeah, a weightlifting <laughs> cycle to increase my one rep max squat clean. And then I need to do EMOMs and I need to do heavy squat clean workouts. And some people are in fact going to get better from that. Like definitely for sure. And you might even just get better at that, um, by virtue of doing that 
you know, more so than you would not focusing on it in your training. But that doesn't mean that that's going to be the best way for you as an individual to actually improve that capacity, right? Like improving your one rep max clean doesn't necessarily make you better at 19.2, uh, meaning uh, toes to bar double unders and escalating weight squat cleans, right? Doing EMOMs of squat cleans doesn't necessarily make you better at 19.2. Just doing 19.2 over and over again doesn't necessarily make you better at 19.2. That for most people, what they actually need to do is understand under what context they can, in fact, repeat somewhat challenging squat cleans for them, right? And then build upon that. So for some folks that is potentially just doing EMOMs, meaning only doing heavy squat cleans and not doing anything else and just trying to uh, change the the weight that they're able to use or change the actual rest period um, in between their reps, right? So potentially progressing from every minute on the minute to every 30 second work to every 20 second work, something like that, that might be helpful. For other people, you know, once you actually have that capacity, then you need to be able to do it under certain amounts of fatigue. So maybe you need to do uh, cyclical work into heavy squat cleans. So maybe you need to do rowing at a certain pace into a certain number of squat cleans, rest and do it again. And then you maybe want to build in weight over that. Maybe you want to build in rowing pace, et cetera, right? But you're, you're accumulating some sort of fatigue and then doing squat cleans. Then once you're able to do that, then you want to be able to do mixed work going into squat cleans, right? So, okay, can we do, uh, let's say rowing, then burpees over the bar, then heavy squat cleans, because that's going to be different than just rowing into squat cleans. Then can we do that in some sort of context that isn't interval based, but is some sort of a, a conditioning like AMRAP or for timepiece. Great. Let's try that out. Can you do that? Can you do that and actually, you know, do a good job throughout and not completely blow up? Great. You can. Okay. Now let's make the mix work shittier, more confusing, messier, and have more interference. What if you do, let's say, uh, wall balls, walking lunges, and squat cleans. Because guess what? You're using the same stupid muscle group over and over and over again, which is probably what's going to happen when you actually have to be tested on your squat clean repeatability. And if you can do that, right, then you're actually in a, in a position to potentially do well in something like 19.2. But then we have to think about, okay, in that case, it's not just the squat cleans, it's the actual volume of toes to bar that was probably messing a lot of people up as well relative to their capacity and squat clean repeatability. So then you try to mix and match that together and you can, and you can sort of go through the same process. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an understanding of where you sit on that progression of being able to do certain movements under fatigue and then building upon that rather than just saying, okay, well, I'm going to do EMOMs and a weightlifting cycle, and then I'm going to get better at 19.2. Cause it's probably just not going to work if you're already at a certain stage of athletic development. Yeah. Uh, like the, one of the things that really like annoys me is when people try to get strong and they're just saying, yeah, I'm just doing strength work and heavy Metcons. I'm like, that's just the fucking dumbest shit ever because <laughs> like <laughs> you can do those heavy Metcons and you're not going to be able to recover or get stronger. And like, that, I mean, that sounded okay in like 2012, but <laughs> it's sort of, sometimes it's like, they're just trying to do everything all at once. Whereas they don't really look at it long term. And if we, okay, let's, talk 19.2 we might need to say hey we're going to spend eight weeks trying to build your absolute strength work on your weightlifting technique at the start and then we're going to start just building your strength in the movement to create a solid base then we're going to start to work on your strength endurance within that movement and a lot of people they don't under, actually understand just going through that process will have a good positive effect on other training elements as well People just think, okay, well, if I'm just focusing on this, then, you know, my whatever, my gymnastics are going to uh, uh, fall apart and my other, my snatch is going to fall apart. And what you don't actually understand is for a lot of the time when, when you actually work on the things that you struggle with, sometimes that actually helps the areas that you don't, uh, the other areas as well. Um, I think there was like a CrossFit.com workout whereby, uh, CrossFit.com article, um, where they said the sort of like the, the variation within CrossFit and the sort of even handedness of it creates adaptation where it needs to occur to then create balance. And I think that a lot of people just think, okay, well, you know, I need to snatch once a week, clean once a week, do this once a week, do this once a week. And then by the end of they've sort of figured all that out, they have no, no time for anything else. And it's like, okay, well, I can't really work on the things I need to work on because I need to do all of this just to be able to, to do this and it's like no that's not how it works you know sometimes someone doesn't need to snatch every week or they don't need to snatch for technique or one day and 
heavy on another day and, and you actually can maintain certain qualities by just you know doing an, an you know Todd you did this with me just do like a nine minute imam of some technique work and I'm like okay well I'm still able to stay relatively close to my max and whilst fatigued as well and it's and that was a big realization for me because it was like okay you don't actually need to do this thing that you thought you needed to do just to maintain something um so it's just I think people need to understand that you know don't do heavy workouts with a strength cycle to get stronger that's not going to happen <laughs> yeah or or it, or it it did work well for certain types of athletes as well and then people improperly extrapolate that to themselves because i i would say that for certain types of athletes right let's let's say the the josh bridges of the world where you know their their absolute strength relative to the field is something that needs to be worked on. Uh, they're clearly very uh, let's say talented with regards to battery and repeatability. They can generally adapt well to a lot of different stuff being thrown at them. You know, if that athlete does a bunch of strength work and gets stronger, and then does a bunch of like heavy metcons, which we can call grinders, so they're not constantly um, going to the well in their training and, and blowing themselves up and having to roll around on the ground after because they do very well with repeatability at high percentages, and they essentially understand intuitively how to pace themselves properly, and they can just do, you know, based upon their their ability to adapt and their ability to, pay, to pace properly, just tons and tons and tons of quote unquote heavy metcons all the time and feel pretty good doing it, you know, that athlete is probably going to do pretty well with some sort of more standard strength progression and then a bunch of heavy metcons because that's that's essentially what they need to work on and they're able to to organize around the training and adapt well to it and so you know you see athletes who have success with that and then develop some sort of following based upon that success. And then they get asked what they do in their training. And they're like, yeah, you know, like I do some West side work. I do some, uh, a weightlifting cycle and I do a bunch of CrossFit and go hard. And that's just not actually what's happening, right? It's, it's what the athlete may perceive as happening, but in terms of their explanation of it, it's just completely off, um, relative to what they're actually doing. And then also that's definitely not what someone who's listening to that should be doing because they're probably not built like Josh Bridges. Their issue is not their absolute strength. Their issue is their repeatability under fatigue and they have a fucking terrible battery. And so just doing a bunch of heavy Metcons all the time is just going to smoke them. Didn't he, uh, didn't he max out his snatch twice at the end of that 2016 snatch ladder? I think so. Yeah, that may have even been a PR for him. I don't remember. Yeah, it was, it was, it was either it was, it was a tie two, or it may have even been it was a, a, it, it was it was a PR tie, and he did it twice yeah. after yeah. ten, eight, six, four. Interesting. No, yep. he's either a freak or uh, something else. No, yep. yeah, but but but, th but <laughs> that's what, a perfect example, right? What's Where, the other thing? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe just like the water he drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. But, okay. but, but I mean, if, if you take, if you take that as an example of like what you should be doing, unless you're built like that, where you're like, can I max out my snatch, match my PR at the end of some crazy workout? If the answer is no, then maybe you shouldn't be doing the same tra training program as someone who's built such that that's a realistic thing for them to do. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's, you, you have these, uh, you, you have these elite athletes that just, they, I mean, we've said it, they're sort of rewriting the book on training adaptations that occur. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people base their training uh, off of that. And it's, you know, it seems like a smart idea. But then they, you know, they, they're trying to hold down a nine to five job as well. <laughs> and this also fun. true. Yeah. <laughs> John, what are you thinking over there? I'm I'm still reeling from the accusations thrown by Luke about Josh Bridges, but I didn't, didn't say anything. I said he's, he's you know he's just drinking some vitamin water or something. V vitamin, mm. vitamin. Sure, <laughs> sure. I know. I mean, I think there's definitely there's definitely people who will see themselves PR in in like open workouts or whatever. So eighteen point two when it was the dumbbell front squat bar facing burpees followed by the max clean and you see people pr there but i think it's not to get confused with elite athletes doing that because that's that's a much smaller group like you see a lot of people who will do that and they're just getting by in pure pure adrenaline and also not having truly maxed out before like they might think oh i've got a pr in this but there was something limiting them actually hitting a true max effort within that and then they do an open workout and hit a PR. And it's like, well, that was probably 
you probably had that capacity. It was just, you've never really figured out how to put it all together. Um, but yeah, it's different it, for an elite athlete to do that. Yeah. So like, I mean, you have these sort of parallels between those people who have like a low training age and the things that they're able to do and, you know, maxing out after doing 55 dumbbell squats and 55 burpees and hitting a PB is, is sort of, that's something that is going to occur for those people who don't necessarily have a high training age. But you also see this on the elite level where people who have got a significant training age do certain things like that. And it's like, there's it, 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 almost people sort of create this, um, this sort of, okay, well, the same thing just happens from, you know, two years of CrossFit all the way up to the elite level. And it's just, it, it's, you know, everything, everything going down, it's, you know, it's very linear. Whereas I just don't think people understand that those individuals are potentially on a different play, playing field. Um, you know, if you look, if I'm trying to think of, the, you, there are athletes who have come from like the weightlifting world who, okay, they do well in those sort of weightlifting, they're, they're involved across it now. They do well in those purest weightlifting uh, contexts, but then when they try to lift under fatigue, they are a lot, they're, they're, not, they're not even close to what they, they were doing before because it's a completely different environment. Yeah, and, and that athlete is also uh, probably on a physiological level a different beast than a CrossFit athlete, right? That these CrossFit athletes are endurance athletes essentially and people who excel in the sport of weightlifting are strength, speed, and power athletes, so, you know, on, on, on the level of like what's actually happening with their muscle fibers and their nervous system and their ability to move around and clear metabolic waste, it's not necessarily just the training of CrossFit that creates an athlete that is going to be able to lift that heavy relative to their max. Like, yeah, that's certainly something that can be improved, but some weightlifting athletes, you know, it doesn't matter how much, how many assault bike intervals you do into a heavy power snatch. Like they're just never going to be someone who's going to be coming close to their, their max potential in a weightlifting movement when they've been doing burpees and front squats. It's just not going to happen. It's two completely different sports. Yeah. And I think that that's where a lot of the time people just make these I mean, even I, I, I used to do it, you know, with um, teaching on like the CrossFit weightlifting courses. It was okay. We're trying to sort of get people to understand weightlifting as a sport, but then we're trying to sort of create this parallel towards uh, CrossFit. But competing in CrossFit and the weightlifting that exists there is completely different. But you do need a good, solid base of the sort of more traditional based work um, to then allow you to you know, to, to do well in CrossFit. But then obviously you see people in, in, in the CrossFit world and they're like hip cleaning their max and like post Metcon and all this type of thing. And, and so a weightlifter, they're like, what the hell is going on? And they're screaming at their laptop when they see the YouTube videos or whatever it is. So yeah, all, all that, all that is to basically say that when designing conditioning workouts, it's not about just doing Metcons or just throwing together workouts that have a movement that you struggle with in it. It's much more about understanding where you currently are in terms of your capacity to do movements that you struggle with or conditioning scenarios that you struggle with. And then figuring out a spot that is in fact sustainable for you, repeatable for you, build upon that to actually improve your capacity, let's say in heavy squat, clean repeatability or chest to bar pull up repeatability or ability to do high turnover pieces of uh, rowing dumbbell hand clean and jerks and toes to bar. And once you sort of understand where you sit with that, then you can progress it into more and more high volume, high intensity and in, in chaotic environments. And then once you're in a situation where it is in fact time to compete, right? Okay. I'm going to do the open. It's around the corner. I signed up for a local throwdown. I'm trying to do the sanctional, whatever that at that point, then you just sort of need to start throwing stuff together and doing a bunch of random stuff in messy scenarios, because that's, what's going to happen during your competition. And it's not about having the perfect uh, competition progression template. It's about progressing all the stuff that you need to progress when you're not competing. And then when you are competing, just having the capacity to, to be adaptable and do whatever is, is asked of you. Thanks for listening. While you're here, go ahead and head over to your podcast player, subscribe to the show, give it a rating, give it a review, all that good stuff. You can also go ahead and click through the show notes where you can find out more about us at legionsc.com and also follow us on Instagram at legion.sc.